the Old Testament, Proverbs 25. And let's begin there with verse 14. Proverbs 25, verse 14 says, Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. In other words, you see the wind blowing and you see dark clouds forming overhead and you, you tell yourself, we're going to get a, a storm for sure. And then it all passes over and nothing happens. Now go forward to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians 6, verse 3. It says there, For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. And one more, which you don't need to turn to, Psalm 119, verse 128. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. Today I want to bring a sermon I simply call Counterfeits. Counterfeits. Specifically in the New Testament, in the church age in which we live. A counterfeit is a pretense, it's a, a forgery, it's an imitation in, intended to deceive someone it's a sham. It's a phony. It's a fake. And sadly, there are many things in this day and age that, are, that masquerade as though they were the real thing, but they're not. They're artificial. They're uh, counterfeits. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11, the Apostle Paul there writes, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So today, let me list for you nine counterfeits in this church age. That's, those are several points, so outline as well as you can as we go. First of all, uh, in the New Testament church, you will find false Christs. False Christs. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5. And then in verse 24 there, he says, For there shall uh, arise false Christs. Two thousand years after the fact, there are still religious figures claiming that they are here to take Christ's place, and that their word as if it is as if it were Christ's word himself. Uh, the most blatant uh, examples of this, of course, are the claims made by the Roman Catholic popes and the priests of that church. Very often, especially in Europe and uh, Great Britain, the pope is referred to as the vicar of Christ. And uh, a parish priest is sometimes called the local vicar. And uh, it comes from the Latin word vicarious, which means a substitute. We have words like it in our language called like vice president, vice chairman. And it's the idea that if the president were away, then the vice president would, would then be in charge of all matters. And since Christ isn't here physically on the earth as he once was, they believe that he's left the popes in charge of all of men's spiritual needs and spiritual matters. Uh, but the Lord warned us about these types, saying, they shall deceive many. And this kind of deception isn't just restricted to Roman Catholicism. You'll find people of all stripes and every kind of religious background uh, you can think of who have the same mindset that somehow uh, God left me in charge of other people's spiritual business. Secondly, in the New Testament church, there are uh, these kinds of leaders are followed by false Christians. False Christians. The Apostle Paul wrote, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Galatians 2. Verses 3 and 4. 
there are always plenty of professing Christians who want to be the Holy Spirit for you uh, and tell you that if you really want to be sure of your salvation, you should do this or you should do that. If you really want to uh, please God and you want God to be happy with you, then why don't you follow my example? There's no, no humility in that person, right? Um, do like I do, dress like I do, talk like I do, smell like I do, um, and, and God will be more pleased with you. You have to wonder if that person knows anything about the grace of Jesus Christ at all. You know what? Changes take place in a believer's life over time. Changes outwardly, changes inwardly. That hot head of that hot fuse, short fuse to hot temper you used to have begins to mellow out a little bit more as you grow uh, as a Christian. You're not as impulsive, perhaps, as you used to be. You understand that sometimes God is patient with me and he wants me to be patient with him. He wants me to be patient with the world around me. And um, uh, those are inward changes and sometimes outward changes take place. Uh, sometimes the, the circumstances of life force that change to have to take place. You might take a job and you're a two-pack-a-day smoker and they say, we, we are a completely non-smoking facility inside, outside the building. No one's allowed to smoke here, so you have to quit it. You have to give it up. Uh, or any number of things. But those, those things are, the, are matters of the heart. They're matters of the conscience as God begins to reveal himself to a new Christian, perhaps, and they begin to be inspired by God. They begin to read his word and they begin to be led in their thinking and their view of the world by what they see on the pages of the scriptures. And nobody can force that. No two uh, chicks start hatching out of the egg exactly at the same moment. And you can't expect all Christians to mature and grow and to change and maybe to get better um, in the eyes of the world, in the eyes of God, at the same pace, at the same rate. But there are, always, there are always some false Christians who want to come along and think it's their job to monitor that. Thirdly, let me say this, false Christs and false Christians naturally have a false gospel. They have a false gospel. We read, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Galatians 1, verses 6 and 7. As Paul says there, it's not really another gospel at all. It's the same old uh, uh, canard of every religion that somehow water baptism or your good deeds, your good works, are necessary to make sure that you're saved. Somehow you have to do something to earn uh, salvation or earn your favor with God or your entrance into heaven one day be fully saved. The Mormons uh, have these temple uh, outfits. It's usually an all-white dress for the ladies and an all-white suit, white coat, white pants, white shirt, white tie, white belt, white shoes, white socks, uh, and mostly white people too uh, in Mormons. And, um, and they all wear this green apron in the front. And this green apron has the patterns of fig leaves stitched on the front of it, Kelly Green. You know, for the Christian, for the Bible believer, the story of Adam and Eve in the garden, the aprons that they made of fig leaves and sewed together, that represents man's effort trying to cover up his own sin. But the, the uh, uh, skins, or the, the coats of skins from a slain animal represents what God did to cover men and women's sins. There's a great deal of difference in it. But um, it was a, and that was a foreshadow of Jesus Christ. Some animal's blood had to be shed, and that animal had to lose its life to provide a covering for the sins of the woman and the man in the garden. And so does the blood of Christ shed at Calvary uh, offer a cover for your sin. And the perfection and the righteousness of Jesus Christ is then credited to you. It's imputed to you. It covers your guilt before God. So God sees you. He no longer sees you wicked and filthy and stained because of your own sin. He sees you now 
clothed with the perfect virtue and righteousness of his son. The Seventh-day Adventists claim that you might be saved by grace through faith, but good works, good deeds are necessary in order to keep your salvation, keep from losing it. You know, become a, a worship only on the seventh day, uh, become a vegetarian, uh, any number of things that they think are uh, essential. But um, every false church promoting a false gospel believes that somehow water baptism is necessary for your salvation as well. And this is easily dismissed. I'll show you how you can do it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the first four verses there, the Apostle Paul outlines the gospel that he was preaching. He says how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he, rose, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. It was the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that the Apostle Paul was preaching. He said that was the gospel. But in chapter 1 of the same book of the Bible, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17, he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, lest the gospel of Christ should be made of none effect. That means that water baptism has nothing to do with the gospel. And point number four today, there is false worship. There is false worship. Christ said, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9. In my humble opinion, I would say this describes the state of old, stoic, uh, Protestant uh, church denominations very well. And uh, why, what I mean by that, groups like Lutherans, Episcopalians, uh, Presbyterians, certain Methodist groups, and even some Reformed uh, theology groups, any church where the minister has a special robe, right, a special costume that separates him from the common man, um, they have their apostles' creeds, they, they recite the Lord's Prayer like any good Roman Catholic would do. Uh, habitually. They uh, have the Canons of Dort. They have the Westminster Confession. Those things might have uh, served a purpose once upon a time, but those denominations haven't progressed with Jesus Christ an inch in 200 years. They believe in their denomination more than they believe in having a relationship with the living Jesus Christ. It's a sad thing indeed. So while they use much of the same language that a real believer might use, um, they've never learned how to rightly divide the word of truth or what that means. And uh, they've never understood what it means to be eternally secure in their salvation. That is, it's God's doing uh, on the part of the sinner, not the sinner's doing for the sake of God. And they never understood how to study the word of God and see what God wants of them. Point number five, uh, false worship eventually produces false doctrines. False doctrines. Hebrews 13, verse 9, cautions us, quote, Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been ex uh, occupied therein. Paul mentions meats as an example. You know, no Catholic ever got saved by simply avoiding meat and only eating fish on Fridays. No Seventh-day Adventist uh, made it to heaven by being a vegetarian. No Mormon ever got to heaven by giving up coffee and tea or anything with caffeine in it. And for that matter, no JW ever got to heaven by refusing to celebrate Christmas or celebrate birthdays. And all those groups, uh, without exception, teach that water baptism in their water is necessary for your salvation, to bring it about, to affect it, and to make it real for you. You know, people can obsess about all sorts of trivial things that uh, are completely irrelevant. 
that, that mean nothing. Um, as Paul says, such things, quote, have not profited them that have been occupied therein. You spin your wheels, you spin your time and your energy worrying about something that has absolutely nothing to do with your eternal consequence or your eternal uh, reward in heaven. Catholics teach the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception of Mary, that the Virgin Mary was born without any stain of original sin. So what? What does that have to do with me? How could that doctrine affect me? How does it benefit me? How does it have any uh, uh, part of my life whatsoever? It has nothing to do with me as a sinner who needs to be forgiven. Nothing whatsoever. But they obsess with it and they're, uh, they're consumed by it. They teach the doctrine of transubstantiation. That the priest takes that wafer and that wine and through a little hocus pocus, by the way, that's where the phrase comes from. The Latin phrase is hocus corpus meum. This is my body. And Americans were always great at twisting somebody else's sacred cow. And that's another one. Um, and we're always great at twisting someone's uh, religious words and turning into hocus pocus to mean a cheap magic trick. And that's basically what's going on. And he claims that he turns that into the actual flesh and human blood of Jesus. And that's how a Roman Catholic gets Christ in them, by swallowing the flesh or drinking the blood. It's not a simple matter of faith between you and God. It's you actually eating his body and drinking his blood. That's how you get Jesus in you, according to Roman Catholicism. Over in Lanciano, Italy, northern part of Italy, there's a town that claims uh, they have some coagulated bits of wine or blood in a, in a crystal container and also some little fragments of, of one of the Roman Catholic uh, wafers that somehow magically turned into human flesh about 500 years ago. And these things are kept in these crystal um, containers for the religious faithful to come and, and bow down to and worship to and press their rosary beads against it and pray to, to the Virgin Mary over it and so forth. Let's just suppose that that junk inside that container is actually human flesh. Let's just suppose that that's actually real human blood, this little glob, uh, globules that have coagulated over centuries. Let's suppose that's real human blood. Who wants to stick that in their mouth? And Jesus said, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. So putting it in a container for people to look at won't benefit anyone. So they don't even believe it. Oh, they say they believe it. But if you pressed them on that point, they'd say, well, I don't want to do that. But false doctrines abound. They're everywhere. And uh, they serve, you know what they do? They serve as distractions. So you get your eyes off the, off the real issue, and that is your own soul. The lost condition of your own soul. Where am I going to spend eternity? How can I be saved? And that's a very simple question to be answered. Point number six today, many of today's churches also profess false science. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. 1 Timothy 6, verses 20 and 21. Evolution is not science. It is not a scientific discipline. It's profane and vain babblings. You know, the very idea of evolution, that the earth, that man, that the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, and the universe are all progressing, getting better and more complex automatically with no purpose or direction behind it is not a scientific proposition. That's a philosophical suggestion. It's a, it's a religious belief. That's why it's called the theory of evolution. Nothing, it's impossible for nothing to have exploded into everything. The Big Bang Theory. Nothing means nothing. And if there's nothing there, uh, it can't explode into everything you see. Something has to be there first to, in order to explode. And uh, man hasn't evolved from some lower primate. You know, in the Roman Catholic uh, Catechism, 
they say, since the theories of evolution have been popularized, theologians have come to agree that transformism or the development of the first man's body from a lower form is compatible with the faith. That's what I, that's what, uh, I have a, a reference book written by a Catholic priest on the Catholic Catechism. But um, it's a philosophical idea. You can't measure any of it under scientific conditions. You can't measure evolution. You can't observe it. You don't see it happening. Uh, and, and not just evolution, I might add global warming is a scientific hoax as well. You say it's getting warmer. Yeah, it's summertime. That's why it's getting warmer. And man hasn't evolved from a lower primate, but we uh, and the animal kingdom all come from the same creator. We are the same designers. Kent Hoban likes to refer to God. So it, it wouldn't be un, unthinkable that there would be certain similarities in the creation God made. The idea that so many animals have four limbs. You and I have four limbs, right? Two arms, two legs. Or that, that the similarities between the structure of our hands and feet would be in some ways similar to those of the great apes or chimpanzees and monkeys and so forth. The idea that, that we're related to each other, the only relationship we have is that God, the same God, made both of us. Otherwise, there is none. Evolution is false science, and its chief purpose is to cause doubt in the Word of God. It's to, to get your mind off of the Word of God, not be able to trust it, and start trusting the words of men. That's the whole chief purpose that uh, the theory of evolution serves. My point number seven today, in the New Testament church age, we also have false prophets. Boy, aren't there a lot of those. Right. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world, 1 John 4, 1. You know, years ago, Benny Hinn, oh, Benny, I like Benny Hill better, uh, but Benny Hinn on, on TBN, live television, he said, he predicted uh, right in front of the cameras, by 1993, God revealed to him that the whole homosexual movement in America would be destroyed. How did that turn out? It wasn't destroyed. They got stronger. Now they're marrying each other. Kenneth Copeland, I think my dad and I were watching this. He was sitting on the, on the set there on TBN, and he looks right in the camera and says, God has told me there's a man out there watching, and you've, had, you've lost an arm. It's been severed in an accident, and God showed me God is going to grow a new arm back onto your body. I didn't hear about that in the news. How'd that work out for you? Don't you think something like that would have been widely reported? Even if it was in the weekly world news, right? right? Or the, the tabloids at the grocery store? It, it would have shown up somewhere in print or in the press, but it didn't. And they keep getting exposed as frauds, as charlatans, as counterfeits. And as soon as they do, another guy steps into their place and he gets a big following and people follow him. It just never, it's never ending. Um, but they don't have the gift of prophecy. They can't foresee the future. You know, send in your donation and if you want your miracle, right? Tuck in your love gift to your prayer partners and your, in, your income will increase. How is it that the kingdom of God is somehow tied to their TV station? We're building the kingdom. Why? Well, you have a chain of TV stations around the world. That's the kingdom of God. I don't think so. And the only prophet they're connected with is spelled P-R-O-F-I-T. You want your healing? Tuck in your love gift to your prayer partners. Get your healing. And point number eight, and this is a sad uh, reality, but today there is a lot of false prayer. False prayer. The Apostle James writes, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, 
that you may consume it upon your lusts. James 4, verse 3. Prayer isn't only asking God for stuff. If prayer is, is simply defined as talking to God, then we ought to check with the Word of God and see what it is we should be talking about when we approach Him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 points the way for us. Verse 16, rejoice evermore. Boy, I'm glad I'm saved. So celebrate your salvation. Celebrate what you know about God. Celebrate whatever uh, new thing you learn when you open the Bible. Rejoice evermore. Find some reason to be happy that you're saved. I'm glad I'm not going to hell. Thank God for any blessing that comes your way and uh, never stop thanking him. Never stop realizing how blessed you are, how fortunate you are to have a God that loved you enough to come into the world, to live among men, die as a man. He can identify with men and took the judgment of your sin on himself. Verse 17 says, pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean drive with your eyes closed, you know, praying without ceasing. That means everything you do should be done as a form of gratitude and yielding and submission, or being yielded rather and submitted to God and His will, whatever it may be. And then verse 18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Do you want to know what God's will is for you? People wander through life, I don't know, I wish I knew what God's will is for me. Look up the verses that describe what God's will is. Put them all together and see if that doesn't start leading you in the right direction. One of the things his will says is for you to give thanks in everything. Uh, um, uh, Ephesians 5.20 says, Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So prayer is primarily an exercise in thanking God and praising God. David also prayed, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Uh, Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Prayer is uh, a time of self-evaluation on your part. Have you failed the Lord any, in any way? Have you embarrassed Him in any way? Have you disappointed Him in any way? Those things should all be sought out and revealed uh, and exposed and admitted to when you talk to God in prayer. You don't just go to God and ask for something. Go to God because you need to talk, so, talk to somebody. Brother Del Grande is going through a very difficult time. I'm not going to give you the details, but he wants me to pray for him. And I, I, I assure him numerous times, almost every day, I'm praying for you, brother. And uh, sometimes that's, that's all you can do. Sometimes that's uh, and all the time, that's the best thing to do. When you can't trust anyone else, and you can't turn anywhere else, and you can't seem to find a solution from any other uh, quarter in life, go to God. Go to God with it. You know, you get on the phone, you'd call your friends about it, you get on Facebook and see what your so-called friends think about it. Uh, you email or text somebody, and you're wondering what they have to say about it. Why don't you talk to God about it first? But prayer is more than just asking God for stuff. Prayer is thanking God and praising God and, and being yielded to God and whatever He wants from you and asking Him to show you where you're weak, what your strengths are, what you can do for Him, what your talents may be, where you've failed Him, where you've disappointed Him along the way. And, he, and, and, and not be afraid to have it all laid out, uh, exposed, and bare for God's uh, help. And lastly today, point number nine, in the church age, there are too many false Bibles. There are false Bibles. Paul writes, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 17. Peter adds, being born again, not of corruptible seed, as silver or rather, 
but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. First Peter 2, or rather 1, verse 23. It's almost an unspoken fundamental of the faith that every true Christian should believe in a perfect, uncorrupted Bible that God has given to him. A Bible that he has access to. A Bible he can hold in his hands, he can read with his own two eyes. King David wrote, The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. Psalm 119, verse 130. You should believe that every uh, word in your Bible is the right word. That's the word God wants you to read. That's the word he wants you to see. That's the word he wants you to know and memorize by his providence. And now it's his job to teach his word to you as you read, little by little, day by day. Bob Jones Sr. said he never met the man, uh, Catholic or Jewish or even atheist, who once he turned to Christ as his Savior, didn't suddenly believe all the Bible to be true. Your understanding of sin and salvation and the grace of God will be will be depend upon which Bible you're reading. Your understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ will depend upon which Bible you're reading. Your understanding of the will of God will depend upon which Bible you're reading. We read, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Psalm 9, or rather 19, verse 7. The NIV, the non-inspired version. Some guy asked me, you still believe the King James Bible? I said, are you still NIV positive? He had to laugh at it, but I don't think he appreciated my comment. But the NIV, in its, in its introduction pages, 1978, they confessed, This translation, like all other translations made as they are by imperfect men, undoubtedly falls short of its goals. Well, then you'll understand why we're not interested in reading it, right? 1 John 5, verse 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. That's probably the clearest verse on the, the triune nature of the Godhead, the Trinity as it's called, in the entire Bible, Old or New Testament. That entire verse is missing in the new versions of the Bible. They just skip from one verse to the next and put a footnote down at the bottom saying that one verse doesn't belong. 1 Timothy 3, verse 16 says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and lastly received up into glory. That's probably the plainest and simplest verse on the deity of Christ and the incarnation of Christ. God in human form. And in all modern Bibles, the word God has been taken out. It simply says, he appeared in a body, or he was in the flesh. Who? They don't even tell you who. Acts 8, verse 37. Philip's witnessing to the Ethiopian eunuch in the chariot, and he stops the chariot, and he says, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Verse 37, Philip says, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then they went down and got baptized. That entire verse is missing in the new versions of the Bible. Somebody's trying to promote the idea that water baptism is a necessary part of salvation, and it's not. So they take out the idea that you have to be a believer first. We're going to have a baptism, not today, but we're going to have a baptism service next Sunday for a few that are ready to be baptized as new Christians. And let me say, water baptism never saved anybody. And it won't save them. It's a simply a testimony that they've already been saved. That's all it serves. Now, these things I've listed and, and several others which I didn't are all counterfeits in this age of the New Testament church. 
And they're all working together to get the world ready to receive one great counterfeit savior, the Antichrist, who will make his appearance uh, on the world before much longer. He'll make them think that they're worshiping God rather than worshiping Satan himself. Now, but the groundwork for his appearance has already been laid, and uh, that's why we say, even so come, Lord Jesus.